I think the thing that's going to change everything is machine learning, is artificial intelligence systems and robotics. The, 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 this is a, uh, an enormous uh, dog's leg in, in human history in a way. The fact that uh, uh, intelligence systems can teach themselves, can learn and become even smarter than they are already. And the applications of that are unimaginable in a way. I mean, if you think about the fact that it's already pretty well on stream, that some um, systems can do things better than human beings can. I mean, we know this, you can play chess, can beat people at Go and so on. But um, thinking about the future, brain surgery, probably done better by a robot than by a human being, uh, and generalize that thought to so many other things that human beings do now. And we can see a big shift in uh, how we organize our societies and our economies. Some people are very pessimistic about it and say, well, machines are going to put us all out of work and then we're going to have to have a national wage, but it can't possibly be very high. There'd be a lot of unemployment and you know, a lot of dispirited people. I don't think that's true because when you look across um, the, the, the centuries, you see uh, new technologies do displace people for a time, but then that creates new and different opportunities and you know, creates a sort of bulge elsewhere in the economy and people move into it. So if it were true that a lot of machine systems will take over a great deal of what we do now, that will give an opportunity for, I don't know, the leisure industry, education, lots of, of, of different areas of economies to take over and people will move into those and, and do those things. But one really uh, um, wonderful uh, effect of that, if that's what happens, and um, for somebody who's involved in education in the humanities like me, is this. Nowadays, people go to school and to university so they can get a job, so they can be trained for a vocation or a profession. But uh, Aristotle a long time ago said, we educate ourselves so that we can make a noble use of our leisure. So maybe the emphasis in education will switch back to educating people for life and not just for work. When we contemplate what we could use our technologies to do, if we thought that um, it would be very desirable that they should produce just pleasure, just distraction, entertainment, uh, taking away from us some of the things that make us do art or write novels or think again about the human condition and human possibility, I, I think that would probably be a bad thing. You know, we could sort of achieve that already. We don't have to spend all that money on technological advances. We could just put bucket loads of Prozac in the public water supply and then nobody cares about anything. But is that what we really want to be? Great question is asked, you know, what do you, which would you rather? Would you rather be a, a happy pig or an unhappy Socrates? It's an interesting reflection that uh, too much fun means too little meaning. Yeah, so we, we don't want that to happen. And um, that, that, that uh, opens up a, a, another set of questions, which is uh, if we again look at the lessons that history teaches, we notice that new unexpected worlds, new kinds of challenges, the loss of old challenges, um, the, the, the shift that uh, is induced in the way we see ourselves and the world around us sometimes brings things into view that were unimaginable before. So if machine intelligence and robotics really takes over large tranches of the things that we normally do, the drudgery, the, if health improves, if people live longer, if um, we do actually spend a more time in our orgasmatrons than, than we you know do in 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 public transport, let's say. Nevertheless, new horizons might open as a result of this. New problems might come into focus. Whole new terrains of thought might be offered to us, and so there could be a huge shift in that respect. So I think it, it's wrong to be pessimistic about these things. Instead, we should always be alert to the possibilities of the radically new that we can't even imagine now. Um, I was at a recent discussion in London about whether or not there would be an intelligent singularity kind of tipping point which would you know, open up horizons uh, really difficult even to conceive of at the moment. And there are some people who are very sceptical about it, people think this is going to be linear, that um, we, we will either uh, consciously or just in virtue of the intrinsic barriers to the sorts of progress that we're kind of conceiving at the moment actually have a linear rather than a sort of tipping point uh, uh, moment in the future. I rather expect actually that there will be some kind of singularity, that there will come a point where um, the, the, just the sheer exponentiality of the increase of, of, 
of power, of computational power, um, of um, what systems can teach themselves, how they can reprogram themselves. You know, that there, there is something to, um, to, to consider there. And so part of what we consider will be, is there anything that we can put in place that would constrain it? I mean, after all, technology has already taught us some rather um, anxiety-provoking lessons. One is that our uh, communications technology like email and Facebook, social media in general, mobile telephony, for example, and the internet, cyberspace as a whole, all this has resulted in a massive loss of privacy by individuals. Because now any agency, private or public, can find out what we think and what we do and where we go and where we are uh, at any moment that it cares to. So we made a kind of Faustian contract with these new technologies. Uh, the benefits of them are huge, the disbenefits of them are potentially great as well. Same thing might happen in the future. But is that a reason for being so afraid of it that we don't do it? I don't think so. I think we should have the courage to go as far as we can uh, and be as courageous and as thoughtful as we can when these new challenges come up. I'm often minded in being asked questions about the future, what might happen and when things might happen and so on, of what people said before the First World War in the early years of man flight. They noticed that biplanes flew better than monoplanes, so they predicted that the planes of the future would have 12 wings. This is just a perfect example of what a mug's game prediction is. It's terribly, terribly hard to say, but I would imagine that, that in the case of um, uh, computational power and the technologies that uh, will be able to teach themselves to increase that, that power and to take on capacities that um, we can only dream about in science fiction terms at the moment, but that's probably sooner rather than later. It's almost certainly this century, I shouldn't wonder. Uh, and um, when you think of the consequences of it, the application of it, think, for example, of feeding into a system that teaches itself and which has now become super, super intelligent. Information about the human genome and about um, you know, g genetic predispositions to diseases and what we should do about it and so on. You know, m medical science could be transformed by a sort of big data approach to how diseases occur in people, diseases like cancer, cardiovascular disease. And we might see within a matter of years of that happening the um, a a absolute elimination of these sorts of diseases. We might see information about human aging, about uh, the way that the telomeres uh, uh, are affected by time, uh, and we might see people alive today, um, you know, in advanced stages of aging already, nevertheless rejuvenating and living on for many more decades. I don't know, it's, it's the, 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 the sort of science fiction possibilities are sky high, and it may very, very well be that it's a lack of imagination and lack of knowledge now which is limiting what we see in the way of those possibilities. When a tipping point comes, the consequences, the effects, could be much, much greater even than we think now about what would follow on the other side of the singularity. It cannot be beyond the wit of, of the human mind to so uh, work with the increasing power of machine intelligence to direct it in rather positive and uh, affirmative ways. Uh, unfortunately, a great deal of the work which is being done already in machine intelligence has to do with how to profile a potential enemy. So we're thinking about the technologies of war, and we're thinking in particular about autonomous uh, weapon systems, which have either um, uh, only a human on the loop or a human out of the loop uh, you know, aspect to them. At the moment, drones are human in the loop systems, so somebody's actually operating the drone, people are actually looking at the uh, camera images, making decisions about whether or not to fire missiles and so on. Um, it's already the case that there are autonomous weapon systems, for example, Israel has an air defense system which is automatically operated by incoming uh, rockets. Uh, and the United States uh, Navy a long time ago talked about uh, autonomous underwater systems that could identify, track, um, make decisions about whether to attack or not, uh, you know, from, from the data that it's able to accumulate in its environment completely automatically. So the um, prospect of uh, um, human out of the loop system, so no human surveillance of what the system is doing, it's making its own decisions about uh, when to attack and who to attack, 
on the basis of profiling, on the basis of information it thinks it has about whether somebody's surrendering or threatening. You know, I mean, the kinds of things that we human beings are pretty good at because we can read other human beings' intentions and we would need to be able to program these systems so finely, so minutely that they could make those same discriminations. So there, there, there are some things to be very concerned about and uh, as I say, it has to be within our competence. So to bias our machine systems that in general they do what we would think of as the right thing rather than to go haywire and to do the wrong thing. It must be possible to do that and certainly we ought to be doing it. Uncertainty is something which uh, faces humanity every day of humanity's existence actually because every day is something new. Uh, every day sees the, um, the sort of fallout of uh, conditions which are present today and were present yesterday. You know, everything is evolving and bubbling and moving and changing. And we're all very familiar with chaotic effects, you know, so small adjustments now have very big consequences later on. And if we go back again and look, look at the lessons that history might teach us on this, imagine the very first Portuguese sailors in their tiny little frail ships starting to sail down the coast of Africa, uh, starting to try to cross the Atlantic. I mean, these, these um, adventurers had no idea whether they were going to fall off the edge of the planet or be eaten by huge you know, beasts in the sea or never be able to return home again. You know, for them, it, it was like um, sort of going into space with nothing but a gas mask or, or a, you know, a scuba diving set. Um, they had tr tremendous courage, therefore, great inducements also, obviously. But what they faced all the time was gulfs, abysses of uncertainty. So how did they do it? And when we answer that question, we can answer the question for ourselves now. And the answer is this, indomitable human curiosity, the courage to face the new, the flexibility and preparedness to try to deal with, with whatever it is we're going to encounter. And actually, we, we sort of explore this all the time in our fictions. Take something like Star Trek. Star Trek was a, a, a television series all about encountering uncertainty and the new and, and uh, you know, really life-threatening possibilities. Uh, and somehow or other, it's a kind of commonplace that there are among us people who are really up for that, the kind of people who go to the Antarctic or go into outer space or, the, or, or into the deepest parts of the oceans. I don't know, I wouldn't do it personally, but I'm absolutely fascinated by people who do it and I love to hear the reports they bring back.